My goal with this tutorial is to enable you to actually build useful things using AWS Lambda functions. In my opinion, the best way to achieve that is to actually build something useful, and this is exactly what we will be doing today. First, I will explain some general things about AWS Lambda functions, like the general structure of Lambda functions, their parameters, return values, logging, and so on and so on. And after we've built some general understanding about AWS Lambda functions, we will be building an actual useful Lambda function with integrations to other AWS services. AWS Lambda functions are an awesome tool, especially for helper functionality that gets executed only occasionally. Like for example, background jobs, or like in this tutorial, a notification service that writes messages to Slack. You could use such a service, for example, to get notified in case something goes wrong in your data processing pipeline. So the final product that we will be building looks something like this. I especially picked this example since I wanted to highlight one of the main strengths of Lambda functions. And this is that they integrate with basically all AWS services. So they are the perfect glue if you would like to integrate AWS services that don't have a built-in way to do that. Like for example, starting a processing job when a new file was added to S3. So here I'm in my editor and the first thing that I like to do is to create a virtual environment. So let's do that. And then let's also activate it. All right. Now would be a good time to start implementing our Lambda functions. So for that, I create a new file and call it notifier.py. And the basic signature of a Lambda function looks like this. You have a method. And this method accepts two parameters. One is called event and one is called context. So this is basically the default signature of a Lambda function. As I said, there are two parameters. One is called event. And uh, this is the actual payload that gets sent to the Lambda function during invocation. The second parameter by convention is called context. And this parameter provides methods and properties that provide information about the runtime environment of the Lambda. I don't use it very often but it's good to know that it is there. Another thing worth mentioning is that return values are optional for Lambda functions. So you can have a return value. And uh, you can basically return anything, like strings, numbers, whatever. If you return an object, that object needs to be serializable with JSON dump S. Uh, if it's not, then the Lambda runtime will throw an error. So let's take this small Lambda function and actually deploy it in AWS. So for that, I copy it, I switch to AWS, and then I go to Lambda. I say create a new function, author a function from scratch. I call it notifier. And then I select Python as a runtime. And say create function. At some point, our function is created and we can have a look at it. So this is what AWS is generating for you by default. One thing worth mentioning is that the default file name for a Lambda function is called Lambda function pi and the default name for the handler method is called Lambda handler. So we overwrite that one and paste in our Lambda function. Since we have changed the name of the handler method, we also need to tell AWS that the name is a different one. For that, we go in here, and here we have the file name and the handler method name. So since the file name for now stays under function and I only change the method name, I save that. Then I hit deploy. And now the Lambda function is actually deployed and we could test it. For that, we can click on the test button, then we create a test event. We don't care about the uh, payload for now because we, are, we aren't using it basically. And then I can just say invoke and we see that the response of our Lambda function is some string. We see it was started, it ended, and again, the response is some string. I said earlier that the event is whatever the payload is that uh, we sent to the Lambda function. So we can also just return that, deploy it again, test it again, 
and we see that this time the response is actually um, an object that we um, used earlier that we ignored for, for now. So that's basically what we've sent to our Lambda function. Nice, we've got our first running Lambda, but I would like to give a short disclaimer. The deployments in this tutorial are a typical case of do as I say and not so much as I do. For the sake of keeping the tutorial focused on AWS Lambda functions, I will be creating and deploying everything using the web interface. But you should never, 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 ever do this in real life. You should always use infrastructure as code for this. I will link a video that explains how to deploy an AWS Lambda function with an infrastructure as code tool at the end of this video. So please use that approach. Since we are currently talking about the basic structure of AWS Lambda functions, there is one thing that I like to do to all my Lambda functions. I like to decouple the dependencies from the actual AWS Lambda function. So what I mean by that is, if we go back to our editor, that I like to implement a second method and call it something like inner handler. That, for now at least, gets uh, accepts the same parameters F as our uh, actual Lambda function. And then I like to call it here and pass the parameters. This way you're able to test the functionality of your Lambda function independently from its dependencies in, for example, unit tests, and you have an easy way to mock all the dependencies. I can't go much into detail about unit testing in this video, but I will link a video that shows how it's done down in the description. And I will be using this approach when we will be implementing our notification service. I guess now would be a good time to talk about logging and where to access the logs. Because sometimes when developing a Lambda function, things aren't going as smoothly as in this tutorial, especially when you're a beginner. So where can you see what's going wrong? So the easiest way to log messages is to just use your typical uh, print command. So all those will already show up in your logs. So let's say hello world. If you want to be a bit more fancy about your logging, you can also use the uh, logging library or the logging module from the Python standard library. This way you can also control your log levels and things like that. So to do that, we import the logging library like so. And then we got our logger. So now we see the actual separation of the dependencies. I pass the logger to my inner handler. And here I can then say logger info some info log. Now we can deploy our Lambda function. I copy it and move it over to my AWS web interface, paste it in, click on deploy and I can test it again. And here we see our first message from the print statement. And here is the second message using the logging module from the Python standard library. One last thing I want to talk about before we start implementing the notification service is the usage of environment variables. Environment variables are a way to configure your Lambda function. So for example, let's say you would like to deploy an AWS Lambda function twice, one for development and one for production. And the production one needs some different configuration than the development one. So how should you do that? Environment variables to the rescue. So I will replace the Lambda function that we have so far with this one. So this Lambda function reads an environment variable. So here we see again the decoupling of dependencies. I just pass in the environment uh, that is used and not the module that I use to get the environment. So we can now go ahead and deploy this one. And if we execute it now, it says I'm running on dev. Why? Because we didn't have set the environment variable yet and we use dev as a default. So let's change that. To change that, we go on configuration, environment variables and say edit. Then we say add. I think we called it env, and now we call or set it to prod. 
Then we save that. We go back to our code. And if we execute it again, now it says we are running on prod. And you can use this behavior to change different things between different environments, like for example, file paths or yeah, other configuration options. Now that we've got our basics covered, let's build the notification service. The first thing we need to do is to create a message queue topic and connect it to our Lambda function. We will be using AWS Simple Notification Service for this. So we go back to our web console and we type in Simple Notification Service. Then we create a topic, create topic, a standard one. Let's call it Notifier. And we don't care about the rest and we say create topic. So now we have actually created a topic. Now we also need to connect the topic to our Lambda function. To do that, we go back to our Lambda function. I will open it in a separate tab. And then we select the correct one. And here we can go to configuration, triggers, and add a trigger. And here you see one of the main strengths of Lambda functions because they integrate with basically any service. But we're interested in the simple notification service. Uh, so let's say SNS and we can select our topic that we've just created, say add. And now those two are connected. So to see that in action, I will change it a bit. So let's remove that. And we basically just want to see um, the message that gets sent to our Lambda function. So to do that, we can just use the print command and, and print out the event. So with that deployed, let's trigger a message from our message topic. So publish message, some title, and here we say some message. And now we can go and say publish message, but how do we see now where actually the message is going? To see the full logs of our service, we go to monitor, then we can click on CloudWatch logs. And here all the invocations get locked. And so we select the last one. Did I miss something? Environment is not defined. Ah, yeah. That happens when you copy paste code. So let's Remove that, remove that, deploy again. So let's do it again. Publish another message, some title, some message, publish. Go back to our logs. And this time we actually see our message locked correctly. So here we see that the subject is some title and the message is some message, just like we configured. So that means we have a connection between our message queue topic and our Lambda function. And it wasn't even that hard. That's cool and all, but we wanted to send messages to Slack. So let's implement this next and also discover another way of integrating AWS services. But before that, it would be awesome if you would go completely insane on that like button. If you enjoyed this video so far, that would really help me out a lot and thank you. To be able to send messages, we need to create a Slack app for our channel. And when we are done with it, we will get a webhook URL that can be used to send messages. So let's quickly create this Slack app. For that, we go to our Slack, settings and administrations, and manage apps. Then we can say build, create a new app, hello, from scratch. Let's call it notifier. We select our demo workspace. Then we want to have incoming webhooks, enable, and then add webhook to our workspace, there to the channel. Let's use the general channel, allow, and now we have our webhook URL. Since this webhook URL can be considered a secret, I don't want to hard code it into our Lambda function, but I want to save it 
in AWS Secrets Manager. So let's do it here. Go to the Secrets Manager. Oh. Then another type of secret. Let's call it webhook URL. And then we paste in the value of that. Then we say next. Now we can give it a name. Let's call it secret notif file slack. Next. Don't care about rotation for now. And let's just store it, please. Now we see that it was created and we can receive or retrieve the secret value. So now we also need a way to retrieve the secret from our Lambda function. So how do we do that? Boto3 is the solution for this. Boto3 is a Python library developed by AWS with which you can interact with AWS services. So we can use Boto3 to read a secret from the secret manager. All right, let's implement the Boto3 logic. First of all, let's go ahead and install Boto3 in our virtual environment. Now we can use Boto3 to fetch our secret. So for that, we first need to import Boto3 and then we need to get a client for our secrets manager. So we have it like this. And then we can pass it to our inner handler. All right. You know, in a handler, we can go ahead and use the client to actually fetch the secret. So here we use that one. We use the client to call the get secret value method. Then we need to provide it the name of our uh, secret. It's called no t fire slack. And then we need to change that to the name of the secret. And we also need to import the JSON library. So again, we use the client to call the get secrets value method. Um, that one, we need to pass the secret ID that we've just created. So it's called secret notifier slack. We will get a string in JSON format uh, return. So we need to create an actual dictionary out of the string. So we pass in the secret string to JSON load s. This way we get a dictionary and we can then uh, look up the webhook URL key that we defined earlier in the secrets manager to actually get our secret. So we can now go ahead and deploy that one. And by the way, you should never print secrets. Uh, again, a typical case of do as I say, not as I do. So with this in place, we can test it again. Whatever, I don't care. So we don't care about the parameters. So it runs for some time, but then, yeah, all right, all right this time it's timed out. So we will talk about timeouts a bit later. So the problem here is the cold start issue. And this is one of the limitations of Lambda functions. If you run it again, it will execute much faster, hopefully. No, still not. Okay, this time it actually worked, but we get another exception. And this exception is actually expected uh, by me. So um, the issue here is that the Lambda function needs permission uh, to access the secrets manager. So let's quickly do that. So we go to the EAM and then we need to find the role of our Lambda function that was automatically generated when we created the Lambda function. And then we want to add permissions and attach a policy. Here we uh, look for the secrets, secrets manager. And again, this role has much more permissions than we actually need. But for the sake of the tutorial, let's go with that. So with that in place, we can execute the Lambda again. And this time it actually 
receives the secret from our secret manager. Now that we are able to get the secret uh, from the secrets manager and we have also our Lambda function connected to the message queue topic, now we can finally implement the logic. Since I don't want to torture you with watching me type everything and doing a million of typos in the process, I will paste in some code and talk about it. All right, so this is the code for our notification Lambda function. So let's quickly step through it. So first of all, we have some helper functionality that will, based on the severity of the notification, uh, show different uh, icons in our Slack message. Then also we have a helper function that uh, prepend the severity and the information. And here again, we have a flag with, uh, it's called with ping. And if it's set, then we will have a ping in the Slack message that notifies that there is like a new message in the channel. It sets the severity and the environment and then prints the headline. So here is the actual functionality. And this uses the decoupling of dependencies as we talked about earlier. So here we have, as uh, we just did, the Boto3 library and the um, secrets manager client, but also we have another class which is called Slack Notifier, and we will talk about this shortly. And all those dependencies get passed to the inner handler, and this is where basically the magic happens, and the inner handler can be tested independently from all its dependencies that get passed to it. So what does the in handler do? It gets the event from the message queue and it uh, parses it. So it checks whether the subject of the event is, um, or of the message is Slack message sender. And if so, only then it will execute the rest of the code. Then it gets the message from the SNS message. And the message is actually a uh, JSON as I defined it. So the message has a severity, a headline, and a body. So basically here, we then um, use the helper functions to construct the message. And then we use the Slack notifier um, helper class to then actually do the call to Slack. So let's have a look at this next. So here we define a template that this is basically a template syntax that is used by Slack to construct messages. Here we pass the icon that we just determined, the headline, the message itself. We create a string out of the dictionary that we provide here. We fetch our webhook URL using the same procedure that we have just used. So I need to adapt this, notifier Slack. And this one is called webhook URL. And this is now the actual method that uh, sends the message to Slack. So we get the webhook URL and we then send the message to Slack using this webhook handler, which is determined by just URL open in this case. So we use URL open essentially to send the template to the webhook URL. And if we then get uh, 200, we print trigger successfully executed. And in the other case, we will just show this error message. So that's basically all the code that there is. And now we need to deploy this. Now that our Lambda got a bit more complex, it's not feasible anymore to copy and paste the code. Not that it was a good idea in the first place, but we need another way to deploy our Lambda function. There are actually two methods how to deploy Lambda functions. You can pack the Lambda up in a zip, which we'll be using in this tutorial since it's easier, or you could create a Docker image, upload it to ECR, and deploy your Lambda function from there. So let's create a deployment package and deploy our Lambda using the zip method. We have now two files that need to be deployed, and also let's add a Python dependency, and for that we will add the Bottle 3 library that we installed earlier. Even though that Boto3 is already available in AWS Lambda functions and doesn't technically need to be provided, but we don't have any other dependency in this project, so let's use it anyways. To package Lambda with a zip, we first need to see where the dependencies got installed. So for that, we can use pip show and then say Boto3 
This will tell us, okay, it's in this folder. So let's deactivate our environment. Wait. So now let's go to this folder. And now we can use the zip command to package everything up. So we will use zip minus R and we want to store our zip file in the root folder of our Lambda function. So let's go ahead and what is it? I think it's like four times. Two, three, four. Let's say deployment package zip. And then we add everything that's in this directory. So let's execute it and done. So now we can go out to the root level of our Lambda function. Now we have our zip file and the two files. Now we also need to add those two files to the zip file. So for that, we can again use the zip command. We have the deployment package and then we provide the two files. So, and with that in place, we now have the zip file that can be deployed. So let's do that. We go to our to our uh, web console again, and now we can say upload from zip. So now we've selected our deployment package and now we can save it. All right, now the zip file was uh, uploaded. Now it says that it is too large and we don't have inline code editing anymore but that's actually not a bad thing since you shouldn't do it anyways. So now we can actually again send a message to the topic and see what's happening. This time the subject needs to be Slack message sender since we have that check in our logic. And now we can send the actual message as I said, this time it's a JSON with uh, three uh, parameters, a severity, a headline, and a body. We publish this message. We can go to our monitor and see if everything worked correctly. No. Oh, right, because now the name also changed. So we need to change the name of the file as well, because now the file is also called just notifier. So the file isn't called Lambda function anymore, but it's called Naughty Fire. Save. Okay, let's do another message. The task times out. So let's increase the timeout of our Lambda function. So for that, we go to, where is it? Here, I guess. I oh, know it's in the configuration. general configuration, edit, let's say timeout 20 seconds, save. All right, let's execute it again. We get the message. All right, now again, moment of truth, send it. Let's have a look at the logs again. It's been started. It ended, this time no timeout. Moment of truth again. Is it this time in the Slack channel? And it's there. Since now we've implemented our fancy little Lambda function, I guess now would be a good time to talk about some of the limitations that Lambda functions have. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel to get notified whenever a new video drops. That would be really awesome. So first of all, there is the dreaded cold start issue that we actually also did run into um, yeah, a few times in this tutorial. When your Lambda function wasn't executed for a while and you issue a request to it, it first needs to download the code and start up. Depending on the programming language and the runtime you use, this can take a few seconds and therefore the first request for the Lambda function takes some time. And as we have seen, might cause some timeout issues. 
How long exactly a Lambda function stays warm after it ramped up is not really disclosed by AWS. With AWS Lambda functions, you pay for the provisioning and the execution time of the Lambda function. If your use case requires your service to be always running, you might be better off using something like ECS. I found a nice blog post comparing the costs of AWS Lambda functions and ECS, and you can see there that Lambda functions, when running constantly, might end up more expensive than ECS. Another important limitation is the maximal execution limit. A Lambda function has an execution limit of 15 minutes. Therefore, you shouldn't use Lambda functions when you know that the job you are performing might take longer than 15 minutes, like for example, data transformations on bigger data sets. If you watched this far into the video, you might consider joining my Discord server. I've recently created it and there's currently not much going on, but let's change that. As I stated earlier, if you would like to know how to do deployments correct with infrastructure as code, you definitely want to check out this video in which I explain how to do it using Terraform. Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next one.